to introduce our speaker. Uh, Bob Petrakis is a political science professor and lawyer from, from Columbus, Ohio. He was the election protection attorney on November 2nd, 2004 in Franklin County. He called the first public hearings to investigate voter suppression and election irregularities after the 2004 election and was one of four attorneys to file a challenge to Ohio's presidential election results in the Moss versus Bush and Moss versus Moyers lawsuits. With the Harvey Wasserman, Petrakis co-authored the book How the GOP Stole America's 2004 Election and is Rigging 2008. Without further ado, let's welcome Bob Petrakis. Uh, thanks a lot. I'd like to thank Mary and uh, the PFA for uh, having me here. It's uh, DFA. DFA. Oh, that's the P. Yeah, the <laughs> Pittsfield, I was thinking. <laughs> Democrats, four. <laughs> uh, that's for America, right? Or, right good. <laughs> so, yeah. The, uh, the uh, election, of course, many of you have already read about it or. Uh, uh, I suspect some of you uh, followed it online. There's been an ongoing uh, debate there, but uh, uh, you want it closer? Okay. Okay. Uh, the Ann Arbor area, of course, is uh, very close to where I grew up in Detroit. Uh, my parents are actually in the audience from, uh, uh, from Redford, where they still live. Uh, and you're in a state where you're very, very lucky that uh, uh, the events that occurred uh, in Ohio, uh, while they occurred here, they occurred here on a much smaller scale. One of the things I'm learning as I speak around Michigan, beginning in uh, Grand Rapids, is virtually the exact same things that I witnessed in Columbus, Ohio, uh, took place in Grand Rapids. Uh, today I got a report for a very similar instance in Flint, Michigan, uh, and in 2000, similar incidents uh, in uh, East Lansing. So what I'd like to do quickly is... Uh, sort of three uh, things, the lead up to the election, sort of what happened uh, in Ohio and how many ways uh, I think it's a template as they're moving these approaches uh, to other states. Uh, and then, of course, to explain what happened on Election Day and what obviously is the template uh, for the future. Because uh, unless you stop them from stealing uh, they're kleptomaniacs, right? And we've moved from a plutocracy ruled by the rich to kleptocracy ruled by thieves. And these people are absolutely ruthless. And part of the problem is mainstream Democrats somehow think if they're just nicer that they're going to prevail. No, when, you know, we need to get these people into a 12-step program. Uh, first, they've got to admit we stole the election. We're sorry for it. We'll never do it again. Uh, we're a kleptocracy, uh, and every day they need to be reminded, because a lot of what happened was systematic. Uh, they can't really deny it. Uh, and there was, a, of course, a trial run to this that all of you are aware of, Florida. My perspective as a political scientist uh, and as someone, in 1994, uh, I co-wrote the report in El Salvador. I was an international election observer. I went down there, I co-wrote that report, I edited it, I delivered it to the United Nations. Virtually everything I was trained to look for in El Salvador in 1994, I didn't see in El Salvador, but I saw in Ohio in 2004. Which brings me to, in part, my thesis, is that that which used to be done covertly in the third world, what uh, Frank Church of the Church Committee revealed is benign operations when we investigated the CIA back there in the mid-70s, is that those benign operations, rigging of elections, you don't have to kill anybody, you just have to stuff ballot boxes and manipulate candidates, is that type of covert operation was brought to the United States first in 2000 and on a grand scale in 2004 in Ohio. And that model, as 
the worldview of the president and the neocons behind him as they move forward into the world with a very unpopular agenda that as they lose their mandate at home, the only way they can succeed is by rigging elections here. And anyone who believes that people that wouldn't privatize torture and lie about it, anyone who believes that uh, an administration that wouldn't lie about weapons of mass destruction and start a war as they did in Iraq. Don't use the mic. <laughs> okay, don't use the mic. Uh, but anyone who believes that there is, uh, they're not going to essentially go into other countries as they, uh, they will continue to do so, that these same people would do all these things. Lie about weapons of mass destruction. Break the covenant against torture. But they would never think of rigging elections in the United States really doesn't understand the nature of the Bush administration, of Karl Rove. I mean, if you go back and look at the history of these people, right, and you read an account of how Karl Rove became president of the Young Republicans, it sounds exactly like Ohio, uh, just on a larger scale. Confusion reigned everywhere. If you look at the book Bush's Brain or you've seen the documentary, uh, nobody knew who was supposed to vote. So this is what happened in Ohio when you begin to look at a template of how they won. First of all, uh, following the 2000 election, that they knew it would likely come down to Ohio in 2004. The fact that no Republican has ever won the president uh, who has lost Ohio, that you have to win Ohio if you're a Republican to win the presidency, was not lost on uh, the Bush administration, particularly Karl Rove who rereads Machiavelli every year and likes to brag about it. So they knew where the battleground was going to be. What I found when I was looking at these events, and there were a lot of trial runs. Uh, remember in the year 2000, now this is in the public record. This is not uh, disputed. Remember that in 2000, the election was called for George Bush in Florida, despite an earlier call for... Uh, for again, Al Gore, when 16,000 or so votes disappeared off a computer in Volusia County and were simply taken away by a computer. Then John Ellis, the cousin, uh, first cousin of George Bush, calls the election uh, for Bush. So there were these massive problems with computers. And the computer voting system itself uh, is interesting uh, just to briefly go over the history of computer voting. The first time that these e-voting ma uh, machines were really used were what we call push and pray, sort of push and you just pray they record the right candidate because they're so inaccurate. And that's what the General Accountability Office recently pointed out uh, in its report. And if you haven't looked at it, you really need to look at the General Accountability Office report, which shows that these computers are massively inaccurate and vulnerable in terms of a vote count. It's one of the worst ways to count the vote. Now, the, as you recall, uh, in 1988, the first time they were used was in New Hampshire, in the primary in New Hampshire. Uh, Shoup Tronics, Ransom Shoup was a decent guy. He'd only been convicted twice of election tampering in Philadelphia. Uh, but John Sununu brought these machine in. Bob Dole was winning by eight points in the last tracking poll. He loses by nine. The Washington Post says, we didn't anticipate this incredible, sudden, last second surge for the former CIA director, George Herbert Walker Bush. 17 points off the final polls are uh, with these brand new e-voting machines which have no paper trail, uh, and, are, and think about the absurdity of this, they are partisan corporations run these machines, we privatized them, they are counting the vote with proprietary secret software. Uh, the only democracy in the world. How is this acceptable? What don't the mainstream Democrats get about this? 
you cannot have private corporations secretly counting the vote with proprietary software. Absolutely unacceptable and the starting point uh, for any discussion of these electronic uh, voting machines. Uh, did you have a quick question or comment? Yes, sir. Well, it makes it a lot easier if nobody knows what the code is and it's totally private. And uh, I mean, there's, we can talk about zillions of ways to, I mean, you can, you know, any system that can be accessed by remote, any system where you can use the memory cards to hack into the system. I mean, the cover of Popular Science and Popular Mechanics, both were how to hack the vote in November 2004. So yeah, but it makes it a lot easier when you can't even look at what they're doing. It's like, no, it's a secret. <laughs> Uh, what? It sure, sure. It makes it uh, cyber theft. And even better, as we'll talk about later, now that they're going to register people uh, digitally as well, it's one-stop fraud. They can do everything from register the cyber votes. As we say in Ohio, the election's never over till the cyber vote comes in. So uh, you got to wait for the rural cyber vote and see what actually is manufactured. Uh, and a as we look at this, in part, Professor Friedman, who's at the University of Penn, statistician who's working on a book, should be out in April. What he found in the 2004 election is that about one-third of the Democratic voters for Kerry in rural counties throughout America, America that's dominated by Republicans, about one-third of those people were not in the certified vote. It's almost as if they disappeared and or were transferred. Right? When you use computers, you can claim that's a glitch. They were accidentally assigned to the wrong party. So what's happening in, in Ohio uh, to this day uh, is a systematic attempt to take a step, and they've been successful at this so far, to take a swing state similar to Michigan and, first of all, bring in all sorts of illegal money. So this is what you've really got to look for because they've been very successful in Ohio. Uh, they first began to purge the voting rolls in Cincinnati. Between 2001 and 2004, 305,000 people lost their right to vote in Ohio based on a law no one knew was in existence, an old Ohio law saying anyone who had not voted in the last two federal elections, even if they voted in a local election, could be purged. Now they were purged in Cincinnati, primarily in the inner cities, Cleveland, uh, Toledo. They were systematically purged at the direction of the Secretary of the State, J. Kenneth Blackwell, co-chair uh, co of the Bush-Cheney Re-election Committee. So 305, including one couple on the front page of the Toledo Blade, uh, been voting at the same address since 1960 when they uh, cast the vote in that election, uh, called up and said, are we registered to vote? Said, sure, you registered to vote. And then in late August, they were purged from the voter rolls. So this is what happens on one level, systematic sneak purging of voters. The other thing they did, uh, which was essential in many ways. Yeah. Is that legal? It was perfectly legal under this Ohio law, which virtually nobody knew was in existence, is that had you not voted in the last two federal elections, you could be purged even if you had voted in a local election. What's that? Uh, in, in most cases, very little because you weren't notified that you were in fact purged. And in fact, some people didn't find out they were purged. Uh, the good news is they hired some private companies who donated to the Republican Party to make sure people got the knows, uh, to know. But apparently a lot of these things didn't get in the mail or in one case 25,000 notifications were lost in the mail. Uh, and they blame that on the post office. Uh, I think it was a deliberate uh, loss from my perspective. I don't think in any way that 25,000 notifications were in fact lost. Yeah. Uh, so are you implying also that it was uh, by the selected particular geographies that was... Sure. No, th these were... What, what they selected is essentially areas that were poor, I mean, and uh, minority. I mean, they, they really selected areas where there were heavy voter registrations 
or would be most likely to vote for Kerry. There was a systematic targeting, uh, and this is the great folly of the DNC report. What the DNC report is, they agree with everything I say. They say, yes, 3% of the votes weren't count, another 1% weren't allowed to cast, all these people were purged, and then they make the most absurd conclusion in history, and they go, yeah, but we just think it was evenly divided. It's like, look, the inner city of Cleveland does not vote 50-50 Republican. It voted 91% for Al Gore and for John Kerry. It, to assume an even split uh, is absurd. Uh, it's almost like they wanted to get in all the problems that were wrong to get it fixed without being controversial and suggest that it was biased or systematic against one candidate or the other. But of course, anyone who witnessed, uh, it doesn't take much to say, who oh, I wonder who the people in the inner city of Cincinnati and Cleveland that are overwhelmingly poor and black, I wonder who they would vote for. Half for Bush, half for Kerry. No, it didn't happen that way. Well, was anyone ever questioned as to why Kirby didn't or other? The, um, didn't, it was actually, uh, this is very interesting. So under tremendous pressure, Matt Damschroeder, who's a former student of mine and a Republican who I suggested should be criminally charged, refused to purge the role in Franklin County. I mean, he knew what they were doing. And what he did is he actually resisted. So uh, he would be attacked by Rush Limbaugh on the radio all the time for encouraging voter fraud by not purging these people that weren't eligible to vote. So it really was a systematic campaign. And J. Kenneth Blackwell was able to convince a lot of people. He has the power, the, uh, you know, the Secretary of State, everyone on those boards uh, and the directors, serve at his pleasure. Uh, he appoints them, they serve at his pleasure. He may remove entire election boards as he sees fit. So very few people had the power to withstand the type of pressure that the Secretary of State was putting on him. Yes? Is that law still on the books? Yeah, yeah, it is, and it gets even better. Uh, as we speak, probably this week, they're going to pass a new law. Thankfully, there'll never be another challenge to a federal election allowed under Ohio law. So the, the lawsuit I brought will probably be illegal before the week's out. Do you know anything about the possibilities the, well, that, That's the key question is, what do you know? You live in Michigan. We didn't know this stuff until they were purged. So, uh, I mean, the Democrats were caught completely flat-footed. They used a ton of money, a ton of money, 10,000 lawyers descended on that state and dissected Ohio. And what they'll often say is, well, we didn't do anything illegal. I mean, Ken Blackwell, think about this. Ken Blackwell found a law that said anyone who had registered on, unless it was on 80 bond, white, unwaxed cardboard stock, it was not a legal registration. Now, his own office used 60 bond, and most boards of election use 20 because everyone scans now. You scan it in for the signatures. Hence, he returned thousands and thousands of what I believe were lawfully registered uh, votes. Uh, he returned them because they weren't on that old, thick cardboard stock, you know, which is good for cupcakes, you know, good backing if you're eating a, you know, ho-ho. Uh, it wasn't on the right cardboard stock. Uh, and, you know, of course, he was, it was so embarrassing uh, that he backed down on that. But other things that he did, let, let, let me tell you, I mean, one of the obvious things he was able to do, uh, it's always been considered that a vote for president will count. Actually, a vote all the way up to the county level will count if you're in the right county. It says you must be in the right jurisdiction. So he changed that to read jurisdiction now read precinct. Okay. Now, it gets even better than that. Here's what they did systematically. They changed all the precincts, right? And where, where I live, uh, I live on Brighton and Wilson Road, uh, right off the downtown on the Near East Side. I'm actually an elected Near East Area Commissioner. Uh, the, I used to vote about half a block to the west, right? Uh, when the, when the Republicans came in, and they came in with really strange anonymous money, uh, we now know 50 million of it, uh, was funneled in. They ripped off the Bureau of Workers' Comp. They set up, uh, they found, quite literally, 
uh, Governor Voinovich, now Senator Voinovich's chief of staff, Paul Mifsud, uh, who's an interesting guy. He was in military intelligence and worked with Richard Secord. Uh, and he also uh, came out of military intelligence and ran the Bush campaign in 80 uh, and 88. And he also ran a shaky little group called the Maltese Benevolence Society uh, that was uh, thought to be literally a CIA front. Well, Paul Mifsud found a guy who was nearly bankrupt after a divorce, Tom Noe, who ran a hobby shop, sold Beanie Babies, baseball cards, and rare coins. This nearly bankrupt hobby shop owner was charged with $50 million of secret state investments. And he did some secret things with those investments. The first thing is he gave himself $1.34 million, which he wasn't entitled to. And then he took 12 to $14 million in administrative fees. Now we find the money trail. That money went into Republican statewide campaigns so, uh, in order to get uh, the Republicans in charge of every state office. And it also went into the Bush campaign. It looks like nothing more than systematic bust out of state agencies laundered into a political uh, campaign. I mean, that's what was going on. And not only that, it, from 2001 to 2004, they moved $14 million in illegal anonymous money, which we now know was linked to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, into the Supreme Court races uh, and took a four to three Supreme Court with, uh, with four Republicans, but the fourth Republican was moderate. They switched it into a six to one Republican uh, majority. And these were the people that got to hear our election challenge and refused to hear the election challenge. So if you step back, you can see that everything they did was deliberate and systematic. Uh, the precinct changes. Here, here's what they began to do. So you switch the authority to the precinct level. Uh, I'm supposed to vote, you know, a block away. They close that down. But thankfully, to the east, half a block away, they open up a new uh, neighborhood voting, voting place. But I don't get to vote there. They assigned me more than half a mile away to a different polling place. Thus, we no longer have neighborhood polling places. We have the polling place to which J. Kenneth Blackwell has arbitrarily assigned you. Now it gets even better because uh, his data bank on his computer is six months old. He doesn't update it. So you may be pointed to the other one incorrectly. And then all sorts of people, some on your side helping you get to the poll, others confusing you, are now calling me up and saying, yeah, you need to vote you know, a tenth of a mile away right up the street. And I'm like, no, I know where I'm voting. I've been assigned over half a mile away to a different precinct. Hence, if I would have showed up there where I logically should vote and waited four hours and 15 minutes at Franklin Alternative School, I then would have got there and been told that I had to go to uh, the model neighborhood facility and wait another three hours and 40 minutes to vote there. And this was the shell game that they were playing. In fact, it was so bad in um, Lucas County, where Toledo is, that they actually didn't ever set the precincts in many areas, meaning you could not legally vote. Your vote could not be legally counted. I'm sure Bernadette Noe, the wife of Tom Noe, who laundered the money, I'm sure it was an absolute accident that that, that happened. Uh, Tom Noe used to also be in charge of that, that board as well. So you're getting the same people showing up over and over again in these shell games. In Cleveland, uh, they claim there was some sort of homeland security alert, and they switched the schools at the last second. So essentially, uh, and most of you have heard about it on election day, what happened in Franklin County is uh, you needed 5,000 voting uh, machines uh, per voter based on one per 100 voters. They had 2,866 machines, and they forgot to put out 125. Now, we analyzed the 125 they forgot to put out. Every single one of them is in the democratic rich city of Columbus. None are in the suburbs. Uh, also. 74% of the African-American majority wards, 42 of them were missing at least one machine. 
had one machine less than in the primary. Hence, the largest voter turnout in history is met by the fewest amount of machines. This pattern also happened in liberal college campuses and at historically black universities in Ohio. At Kenyon College, which was a hotbed for Cary, 1,300 students registered to vote. They were given two machines instead of 13 machines, and one of them broke. Disproportionately, the machines that broke all broke in the inner cities, all broke in the Democratic areas, 77 uh, of them in Franklin County alone. Hence, you're creating lines between three to seven hours uh, long. You had similar situations of long waits in Grand Rapids, Michigan, now reports from Flint, Michigan. So some of that same template was used. Do you remember when the uh, representative here said, the only way we can really win in Ohio, I mean in, in Michigan, is to suppress the vote? They have a voter suppression template. And that was added by a group of people uh, who came in, the mighty Texas strike force, two weeks before the election. And these people bragged that it was set up by Karl Rove, right out of the White House. They don't hide it. Two weeks before the election, large groups of people came in, the mighty Texas strike force, and they fanned out uh, to Cincinnati, Cleveland, uh, and Columbus, and they were calling people up. We know, because there's a 9-11 phone call on this, a conservative Republican night clerk at the downtown Holiday Inn called the police on him because he caught him. They, uh, they were data mining. They had state-of-the-art data. And this should remind you of Choice Point in Florida, right, where uh, in order to stop 8,000 felons from voting, they stopped 92,000 people. Uh, now Greg Palace has the number up to 92,000 with same or similar names. Uh, and 54% of them or so were African Americans. They came into Ohio using the same tactics. Uh, for example, in Franklin County, uh, we cancel two to th between two and 300 felony voting rights a year. In 2004, 3,500 voting rights were canceled. They decided, uh, that is the Republican uh, Board of Elections director, whose last job, Matt Damschroders, was Republican Party chair, that uh, K J. Kenneth Blackwell had instructed him to go back to 1998 and cancel everyone's right to vote who had been indicted for a felony, not convicted. Hence, one of my students, one of my students who was indicted in 1998 on a felony, pleaded to a misdemeanor, first degree misdemeanor, voted for six years in the Republican enclave of Westerville, Ohio, an affluent suburb, moved down to Ohio State to finish his schooling, registered to vote, and immediately his voting right was canceled. This is systematic. 22 counties gave felons the wrong information in Ohio. 22 of these uh, counties told people in order for them to vote, they had to get a judge to sign off. That's what they were told. Absolutely false law. Uh, yeah. Paint a picture of pervasive corruption at the state level, essentially the uh, Fox uh, guarding the hen house, or hen house being our right to vote. Are there federal remedies to this? Setting aside the fact that the executive branch is the full executive, are there federal law enforcement remedies? The short answer to that is no, right? You have, we're one of the few democracies where there's no constitutional right to vote. Well, we may have a, uh, uh, a Bill of Rights and, you know, rights of free speech, which are sometimes ignored. The right to vote essentially is a state right. Every state has different laws. And within that state, every state uh, often is left to the county. And in some cases, uh, tremendous variation by precinct. So there is essentially, one, no constitutional right to vote. Uh, two, no federal standards. There's the Federal Voting Right Act of 1965, but that only, for constitutional and legal reason, applies to certain states and certain counties that had a history of Jim Crow and apartheid. Hence, if Ohio had been a southern state that had discriminated historically, uh, Ken Blackwell would be in jail. 
where he belongs. But because we weren't part of that, there was no federal remedy, that there's only state re remedies. And recall, every single elected official in Ohio is a Republican. So they have created a myth of massive voter fraud, claiming it was the Democrats who, for the most part, have done very little to fight back, despite volumes and volumes of, of evidence uh, that we accumulated in the lawsuit. So this is part of what the template is. As you move in with the voter suppression, and then you have a cover story. You immediately shift it to, you know, I don't know how many times I heard about pundits and the Democrats are voting the graveyard. Nobody was voting the graveyard. People were going door to door in the greatest uh, registration drive in all of history, which by the end of the week, you will no longer be able to do that registration drive in Ohio. Uh, it will be a felony unless you register in all 88 counties and undergo training in all 88 counties. Well, yeah, those of you who are sneering, that's because you're pro-crack and you want the NAACP to be paying people in crack. So we've got to crack down on this obvious problem that we're having in Ohio. And the counties where the most irregularities occurred with the voting machines were the counties in southwest Ohio, the southwestern Republican counties where there's no elected Democrats, there's no countervailing power whatsoever. So as we begin to look at what is happening is that you've got a systematic pattern of voting repression uh, that went on in that state that was well thought out. Uh, this mighty Texas strike force, what are they doing? They're caught on the telephone doing this, calling up the names of people on probation, in halfway houses, former felons, and they were caught, and there's a statement sworn on this, uh, by the night clerk, they were saying, look, you've only been out of jail three months. I guarantee it. If you go to vote, the FBI will pick you up. They were caught saying, you've got parking tickets. You show up to vote, you're going to be arrested. You owe back child support, you will be arrested. They were threatening people with arrest from data that had been mined right out of the public records, uh, and what they were doing was illegal but no one was willing to stop them. I mean, people were told that they were illegally registered, official looking people. People showed up in Cleveland looking very nice from the Board of Election, a mobile unit to process absentee voters for elderly people. The problem was there was no such unit, <laughs> but they collected you know, hundreds and hundreds of absentee ballots that never were delivered. And they showed up, they looked very proper, we're here from the Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga Board of Election. We'd like to offer you the opportunity to give us your ballot. We've got it very safe and secure here. This was systematic uh, voter intimidation. And worse than that, worse than that, is here's what they did after the election to fight it. What they did, and we now know, uh, if you look in the free press back there, uh, in Raking the Muck, I've just written a, uh, an article on this, is their approach was simple. Congressman Ney, of course, now linked to the uh, Abramoff scandal. Uh, no surprise, he's out of Ohio, has a long history of corruption. He came into Ohio for hearings on this. Only one voting rights group was allowed to testify. That was the American Voting Rights Institute, which no one had heard of, and there's a reason for that. Why? Because a Google search and LexisNexis will show it was created on Thursday at a post office box in Texas, issued a press release on Friday, and got to testify on Monday on the key problem in Ohio, the NAACP paying people with crack to register to vote, right? Code words for black people on drugs and liberal permissiveness, right? And I've been trying to figure out, uh, and I finally was able to, uh, where this mythology came from. Because uh, Thor Hearn, uh, Mark Hearn, Thor Hearn, uh, who testified, did the testimony, we Googled him right immediately. Uh, thankfully, most Republican operatives like to brag, so his resume was online. He had never worked for a voting right in, uh, organization in his life. 
In fact, he had a job. General Counsel to Bush Cheney, re-election 2004. That's the voting right expert who got to testify. Uh, and not only that, the guy who came up with the story is Alex Vogel. We found just recently in discovery in Wood County where they claim the NAACP was paying people in crack, in discovery we found a piece of paper signed by a man named Alex Vogel which said the guy who brought the suit and made the claims, you were indemnified for this lawsuit, we will pay all costs including countersuits. So a local Republican operative is indemnified by an obscure group. It's sort of, you know, the Ohio Enterprise Coalition. It turns out to be a front group for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and it turns out that Alex Vogel just reemerges. He's the attorney for Bill Frisk uh, in a recent scandal. Uh, and before that, he worked for the RNC. They manufactured the myth of these crazy voters being paid in crack and sold it in a pre-planned way the Congressman Ney, and they're, they're now using it even uh, to add insult to injury. They're now using it to pass a law in Ohio that says everyone will have to be required to supply ID throughout the state because of the massive voter fraud uh, that occurred with fake IDs. It never happened. We have some voter fraud because when we were investigating Kenyon College, right, with uh, with the, uh, you know, two machines for 1,300 voters, we compared it to Mount, Na uh, Mount Vernon Nazarene College, a born-again college where people waited 15 minutes. We found like 159 names of people that were registered at the business office of that college, uh, which was about a mile away. So if you were at the liberal arts college, Kenyon, you waited up to 11 hours in line. If you were a mile away at the born-again college, you waited about an, uh, 15 minutes to an hour at the most. So that becomes part uh, of what is going on here. Uh, other massive irregularities, and we can go county by county. I mean, uh, go ahead. Oh, well, I'll just give you the highlights. <laughs> go ahead. What do you want to say? Yeah, the obvious thing is you need to do is one, I think you got a feel for the template, uh, how this happens with the precinct shuffles. Uh, the voting machines are the ultimate Trojan horse. They're pretty much going to win every election uh, if their guys are secretly counting the vote. So what has to happen is, number one, there has to be a statewide organization. There has to be an ongoing database, and there has to be people in every single county that actually know what these county boards of election are doing, uh, who is selling, who are their vendors, who is selling them software, because it's not only the machine, it's the software, the GEM system, the general election management system, which has two sets of books, which allows you to have perfectly accurate precinct level totals, while your county level will be off by tens of thousands of votes, which we found that too. So, uh, I mean, these people, the one thing, too, and I absolutely believe, I recently briefed the Progressive Caucus of the U.S. Congress, uh, is that up until the General Accountability uh, Office report, is that we were being dismissed as lunatics, tinfoil hats, crazy conspiracy theorists. Uh, Representative Conyers had the decency to say, when we made this pitch, to have the GAO look at it. And lo and behold, the GAO comes back and says, the entire system is vulnerable, uh, it can be hacked, uh, it miscounted many votes. Everything we said that was possible and we believed happened, they came out and said, yes, that's what the system is. But part of the problem is that, quite frankly, I, you know, in Ohio, the Republicans haven't really fought us that hard. They simply come up with a fantasy story. There were no irregularities. You know, black people on crack. It's really been the mainstream Democrats. Uh, and I don't mean the progressive Democrats. It's like the mainstream Democrats who are in denial, who think if they come out and mention this, they'll be marginalized. 
So you're not going to get any reform on the federal level, state or local level, unless we get in the face of every election board and we simply force the mainstream Democrats to acknowledge that there is voter threat, it is a possibility, it's been documented, and that we won't tolerate it unless we take back the vote and know what the counties are doing and demand a voter verified paper ballot and count those at the precinct level, they're going to steal. They're good at it. They've developed the technology. They control it. They've practiced in third world. They've practiced in states. That's what we've got to do is we've got to create a brand new election reform movement with absolute standards because the vast majority of Republican people are on our side as well. And we need to expose this fraud. Mm -hmm. And they're primarily theocrats. Dr. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Mercury over on the West Coast has developed a voting machine. Uh, she does not have these right, uh, right wing ties. And I'm wondering if it might be possible to have a company uh, form an aggro to George Soros. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, would you repeat what he's what, 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 back in here, what he's saying? What, what I'm saying essentially is that. that there is a machine that has been developed that supposedly is auditable and audited voter verified paper trail and would be an alternative to the Sequoias and the ESNS and the Devolts and would give us an accurate count, which is the next best thing to a paper ballot. Well, my question is, I'm not opposed to using a machine to tabulate. My question is, in most cases, you really don't need, having observed elections in other countries, it doesn't take that much to actually have a big sheet. Uh, at the precinct levels, there's not that many votes. And to first get a actual separate voter verified paper trail. Now, now, if you want to then put them into some database, you've got to begin by getting the accurate. I mean, 95% of all democracies count on paper, mark and count on paper. Uh, I mean, you had corruption with the, uh, you know, the old lever machines because in some areas, organized crimes or political machines, in some cases associated with the Democrats uh, in Chicago and other places had access to those. That was kind of a retail uh, voter uh, voting fraud in, the, in big cities. But the new, uh, I mean, these electronic voting machines, uh, I mean, because, I mean, you can make it say whatever it wants. You can have viruses, uh, of course, that, uh, you know, and programs that eat themselves. You'll never know. I mean, it's, it's vulnerable at so many different points, from the transmission uh, line uh, to the remote access uh, to the program itself. I mean, uh, that's Clint Curtis's, you know, when he testified uh, working for Representative uh, Feeney, right, is that if you said, look, this is going to be 5149. One of our jokes is uh, Ken Blackwell is now running for governor, and we say he's already won. He's got the certified results in his pocket. He won 5347. Uh, for the 2006 November election. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't see, I'm, at your one point, I don't see why you would allow any private corporation to count the votes in the first place. Obviously, uh, but I, I would be leery of certain nonprofits. For example, uh, in Ohio, the Electronic Science Institute uh, came out of nowhere and said they'd certify our machines. So they came in, uh, they attacked us. We looked at ESI, the guy who runs it, uh, you know, brags uh, Steve Hertzberg on his website that he essentially spent most of his career as, in, as a civilian analyst in the military, uh, and he has a bachelor's degree uh, in aerospace. Uh, you know, I have a PhD in political science. He's got a bachelor's degree, but he's better at PR, right? He runs the Election Science Institute. So what you find in a lot of these nonprofits uh, is you've got people there that don't even have the credentials. So I, I'm not opposed to, uh, you know, if you want to get the best, you know, David Dill and Avi Rubin and the best computer scientists in America together and sit down and tell us how we can make it as safe as possible and have a, you know, and have a government agency that does it, 
Uh, I'm for that, but I still think at the precinct level, you have to have a voter verified paper ballot and it has to be counted at that level first before any of it is entered into machines. And we have to make it, you know, uh, very stiff penalties for anyone who tampers with this. Uh, yeah, are you aware of the development in Wisconsin earlier this week with the undersigned law that required their voting machines in the state must have paper trail that was logical and that the software running must be open source? Yeah, no, I was aware of that then. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, was I aware uh, in Wisconsin that a law was signed to require a voter verified uh, paper trail and that the machines could be audited and that the source code had to be transparent, it couldn't be proprietary. Uh, that you, there's an ongoing battle in North Carolina which requires all vendors of voting machine to put the uh, source code in escrow so it can be checked. And Debolt, of course, uh, has not been willing to do that. Also, you recall Walden O'Dell, right? The Debolt CEO is famous for many things. One of them writing the 2003 uh, letter pledging to deliver the vote in Ohio to uh, President <laughs> Bush. Uh, but even better yet, I, I mean, I, I've been to Coswell Manor many times in Upper Arlington. This is the same Walden O'Dell, who's a member of the president's pioneer and ranger team, visits the Crawford Ranch and had his house rezoned in Upper Arlington to be wet so he could serve alcohol at $10,000 a head Republican fundraiser. So a period of time, the only place you could get a decent drink, and I regret going there now. No, that's, that's a joke. I, I didn't really go. <laughs> was Wally O'Dell's house in Upper Arlington. That's how partisan this man is. Uh, so yeah, and also I know most of you are familiar, right, uh, uh, about uh, the Leon County, uh, Florida, where essentially uh, the Debolt machines were hacked by computer programmer uh, Hari Hirschstu, who came in and showed how easy it is with a memory card to simply get in, hack the vote, pick the winner without anyone at the board of election even knowing. I mean, the sad part is that if you go to uh, these board of elections, uh, uh, take the fame recount incident with Cheryl Eaton, the deputy director, I mean, uh, we're going to recount the vote in Ohio because it's so strange, right? Uh, uh, Kerry loses with 138,000 votes. Just tidying up the vote, certifying it, it turns out uh, Bush only got 118,000 vote lead. They double count the vote in Sandusky. Uh, you recall uh, Gehanna Ward 1B, right? The famous Fish and Loaves precinct. In Gehanna Ward 1B, the Lord delivered 638 uh, uh Voters to the poll and the miracle of miracles occurred. Uh, 4,258 people voted for President Bush. Uh, and uh, again, it's, uh, you know, you don't need much math to figure out that those vote totals are not uh, credible. Any more in Perry County when we found 124% voter turnout uh, or 120% in another precinct that those aren't credible. But that's the type of thing uh, that was occurring uh, and there are a certain amount of theocratic vote counters, a core of people that, you know, are, will count those votes uh, as they see necessary because they believe uh, their president is on the side, you know, the side of right and justice. Go ahead. Right. Um, and it wasn't like it wasn't like they registered, re-registered recently. It was like they changed their driver's license and their registration two years ago. Mm -hmm. But it was still showing up in the system, and you have to go to Whitmore Bridge. Right. Okay. And you go around and around and around about that. And then and then you know people who had been registered at you know a lot of community and county events where we were registering people for voting, a lot of those people never got on to the register. Sure. And right, and some states have already solved that problem. And uh, when I testified uh, before the election assessment panel for the Carter Baker Commission, I mean, some states, yeah, there's a very fair commission there. Uh, yeah, it was, it speaks volumes. But 
uh, some states, uh, shockingly, uh, when you go to the uh, to the uh, uh, whatever Bureau of Motor Vehicles in, in every state, in most states, when you pay for your, uh, in virtually every state, when you pay for your license plates, you get a receipt. Uh, it, technology uh, long ago created uh, the little scanning bars on the bottom and <laughs> simply a card you could rip in half. Uh, it'd be very easy to have every American voter who registers to vote to get a receipt which has a little scanning bar that's filled out that, you know, is stamped. So when the tens of thousands, because your problem uh, was replicated all over the country, uh, we had at least 25,000 in the Cleveland area alone of people saying, look, I registered to vote. I did it fair and square. I'm not on the uh, on the list. Is that just simply perforate the card. And if they've lost it at the Board of Elections, you've got the actual card there, and you should be allowed to vote. I mean, why isn't that done in every state in the union, in every county, and in every precinct? Is that we allow a system which allows people like Karl Rove and the Bush administration to bring in these privatized vendors to lose these things and sloppy, uh, you know, incompetent bureaucrats that aren't prepared uh, in those scenarios as well uh, to allow this to happen, and we shouldn't do that. You well, mentioned that. Yeah. If we kind of keep the questions for for you focused more on. Good. Uh, okay, so I'll stick to Ohio and national solutions. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, I, you mentioned that something happened uh, this year, apparently, in Grand Rapids and in Flint. I'm wondering if we could shift into, uh, into Michigan a little bit. Well, the, well, the Grand Rapids, was, it was the exact same thing. People showed up. They didn't know what precinct they were in. It wasn't verified. They weren't on the voter registration rolls. Uh, one of the things that showed up in part in the Grand Rapids scenario and in Ohio was somebody put out old polling books. Is that uh, in uh, Franklin County, they put out polling books that were 10 years old. Uh, another thing with OptiScan machines, uh, Diebold, uh, their technicians put out the wrong markers, so those votes couldn't be counted. There's 93,000 votes to this day, to which there's at least a 30,000 vote pickup for carry from the inner city where the, the, they've never been counted, OptiScan and punch card machines. Almost all the follow-ups occurred disproportionately in the inner city. Now, again, I, I'm skeptical. I don't think it was a mistake they put out the wrong markers uh, or they calibrated them wrong. There's a lot of things you can do with these machines. You calibrate them wrong, they're rejected. So that's part of what we're seeing in Michigan. Uh, it just wasn't done on a, a big enough scale to impact the vote as it was in Ohio. Yes. I have two questions. Why hasn't the media taken a lead role in this, like the New York Times and so on? And two, I did not being clear as to particularly the hearing the Democratic, uh, as far as the government is concerned, why hasn't the Democratic Party taken a strong position on these issues? Uh, they started after, I remember the California Times were under the re investigation that was sort of packed over. But why hasn't the media dealt with this on a, uh, because of the serious uh, implications and challenges and, and legal issues that you bring up? Well, the, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, New York Times, when, they first, when I first said the machines were missing, they referred to uh, the Free Press, which is an online newspaper, and we have award-winning journalists. Uh, I won 11 major awards in the state myself, including Best Coverage of Politics. They said we were conspiracy theorists, so I did what anyone would do. I went to the Washington Post and gave them my information. And they said, lo and behold, it looks like Kerry lost about 15,000 votes because of these missing machines. Uh, you know, in my hand at the time they called me a conspiracy theorist, I actually had a list of all the machines that were missing, including the ones blacked out. You know, we weren't making this stuff up. We had discovery. We had sued. We had gotten information under oath. So at later, the New York Times switched its position on the voting machines uh, uh, being uh, missing and how they impacted Kerry. So, but on the other hand, right, you've had Vanity Fair, you had Ohio's odd numbers, right? Christopher Hitchin, who hates Kerry, uh, said the numbers. No, there's a new state law that will require this year for the first time voter verifiable uh, paper trails 
Some counties had those machines, but didn't put any paper in them. <laughs> no, no, they can't be. And a lot of the voter verified paper trail, you can't read them. A lot of them are thermo paper. That disappears like you get it from the bank machine. So by the time you get to it, it's sort of, you need the forensic experts from the FBI uh, to read the actual results. I mean, it's got, it should be, look, it should come down in a window. You should be able to push and you see what shows up. And that should be a voter verified paper ballot of record, you know, to be recounted or counted right there at the precinct. That's not what they're doing. A lot of times they'll, they'll put these little tiny rolls like you get at the ATM, because that's what Diebold did. It was an ATM maker. Prior to that, a safe maker, right? So are you really going to recount off that little tiny roll? So we have to be very clear that we need a voter verified paper ballot, not a voter I verified paper. These new machines, which they brought in, that nobody was trained on and recorded it wrong. In fact, the city of Carlisle in Ohio is now suing because a continuing levy uh, for their fire department, apparently nobody there wants fire protection anymore. And what they were able to do is look at the numbers and say, look, 250 people didn't vote against this uh, because there are only 150 people are registered. So they're beginning to do the basic analysis uh, that we began to do, you know, in Perry County, like, look, there couldn't have been 124% voter turnout. It's impossible. There couldn't have been 120% uh, voter turnout. Yeah, my uh, we're position not buying is... Uh, there's a battle going on for the soul of the Democratic Party. That unless we realize that it is fundamentally wrong for private companies to secretly count our vote, I don't even know why in the hell we're contesting these things. On some level, it's so stupid. So I think we've got a battle. Uh, not only do we have to educate, uh, uh, make sure all the progressives know, but we need to take that ammunition and not let up on the local Democratic parties not let up on, on the county areas, and not let up on these boards of elections, is that they want to keep saying, yeah, that's one issue. No, it's the primary issue. If one side owns the voting machines, owns the electoral process, and is willing to physically intimidate uh, and do everything within the law, legally and outside the law, to repress people, unless that is stopped, we're never going to get John, fair election. on Ed Schultz began to talk about the private machines uh, right before uh, Christmas. His wife earlier in Seattle, uh, you know, at, at that luncheon, kind of blurted out, they can, you know, they can hack the mother machines. And uh, I can give you the rundown. Uh, is uh, Robert uh, Schrum beat the hell out of him and said he would be a, a sore loser, is that he would not be viable in 2008. The fir first and foremost consideration that came out was whether he would be viable in 2000.